Okay, this next video we're making is talking about populism, and it goes with this handout right here, which says farmers in the Gilded Age had two problems. That's what it says at the top, railroads and debts. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about during this um, this part of the the unit, which is we talked about how farmers were the last ones to control the Great Plains, and now those farmers are going to find out that they have a unique set of, of problems that they are seeking more and more government assistance um, to help them with. So that's what this is about. Okay, we're heading right to the PowerPoint. It says uh, you're going to learn uh, who formed the populist party, what did the populists want, and um, were they successful. Those are the things we're looking at today. All right, this uh, whole lesson is in some way based on the movie The Wizard of Oz. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about The Wizard of Oz, see if you remember it. All right, let me... Uh, Seems like most of my students have seen The Wizard of Oz, but it usually as a child. And so I need you to run I need to remind you just a little bit about the whole movie. So if you remember, it opens with Dorothy. She is a, a young lady who is in her house with her Auntie M and uh, her uh, God, what's her they, she's been adopted by her grandparents, it seems. And um their house gets swept up in a tornado, and when it lands, she's suddenly in this new land she's unfamiliar with and these the little people are all around the house and they're very happy with her singing ding dong the witch is dead witch oh witch the wicked witch ding dong the wicked witch is dead so um she's kind of confused about why they're so pleased with her but she knows she wants to go home so the uh, munchkins inform her that she has killed the wicked witch of the west who's under the house her feet are sticking out and um, they're very pleased with her for doing this because the Wicked Witch of the West was kind of terrorizing them. And she says, well, you know, glad to help out or whatever, but I would really like to get home. And they said, well, to get home, you need to follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. And um, Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, comes down uh, and informs her that she needs to follow the Yellow Brick Road to make it to the wizard who lives in the Emerald City and that he will help her figure out how to get home. So Dorothy and her little dog Toto follow the yellow brick road um, down to find the Emerald City and the, the wizard. On their way, they pick up a few friends who also need help. They find the scarecrow, who needs a brain, and the tin man, who needs a heart, and the cowardly lion, who needs courage. And they're going to go through various things. When they finally get to the Emerald City, and they see the wizard, um, and they finally get in to talk to the wizard, uh, Toto pulls the curtain and reveals that the wizard is really just kind of a... a, a a clunky man who actually doesn't have any power and that if she really wants to get home she's gonna have to fight the Wicked Witch of the East who um, wants to imprison her and so I don't want to have I don't have to tell you the end the ends really not important what is important is that whole part up to that because that relates to the lesson we're learning about because a lot of people think believe it or not that the Wizard of Oz is an allegory or a story that actually represents a much more complex political theme so, by the end of this presentation, what I want to do is uh, walk you through a little bit about who the Oz might symbolize Dorothy, the Wicked Witches, the Munchkins, the Yellow Brick Road, Dorothy's Slippers, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, the Lion, and the Wizard. What all do they symbolize as a political allegory? I hope I'm not going to ruin this movie by making it historically um, significant. All right, well, you can look on your PowerPoint there and see that the farmers in the Gilded Age had two problems. First of all, they had debts. They owed money for land. That they had purchased a lot a lot of them had purchased land even though it was being given away through the homestead act they had purchased land because the land they wanted was near the railroads and the railroad companies were selling it also they had bought a lot of machinery and a lot of seed it was hard for them to pay their debts because the wealthy control the banks and the banks control the money supply and the farmers feel that the rich are underprinting money we've talked about this a lot in american history the control of the rich at the National Bank and the money supply. So the rich want less money printed and they only want money to be backed by gold and so they're called the gold bugs. The rich people are called the gold bugs. The farmers want gold and silver printed because if you back money with gold and silver you can print a lot more money because there's a lot more silver in the world than gold. So um, that would uh, allow more money to be printed and it'd be easier for them to get some money to pay their debts and so they were called the free silverites and they supported two metals backing money otherwise known as the bimetallists okay bimetallism and the free silverites and this is one of their symbols from the time period a free silverite symbol okay 
The other problem that the railroads face, I mean, that the farmers face is the railroads. The railroads have a monopoly in most towns because there's only one railroad in each town. So since they have a monopoly, there's no price competition. And so the, the railroads basically charge whatever they want. And the farmers would like the government to come in and regulate the railroads and tell them what rates they can charge. They form a social organization that at first was about sharing uh, farming tactics and recipes called the Grange. But in time, the Grange becomes uh, a lot more political in its efforts to try and bring about government involvement in the railroads. They successfully elect a lot of people to um, local and state offices, and they get railroad regulations passed. The um, railroad companies take that to the courts and say that these railroad regulations are not constitutional. But in the court case, oh, their founder, by the way, is Oliver Kelly, the founder of the Grange. Um, the court case is called Munn versus Illinois. And let me explain a little bit about this. So these, these laws basically said that the government could regulate railroads. Um, what the court case Munn versus Illinois said is, yes, this is true, that the government can regulate railroads and the state governments can regulate railroads that run within a single state. So if we had a railroad here in North Carolina that was going between Raleigh and Charlotte, the state government could regulate that because it all stays in one state. But here's the catch. Do most railroads stay in one state? No. The beauty of the railroads was that they went across the whole country, and that's interstate travel. And there's only one body that can regulate interstate travel, and that's the federal government. So while the states could regulate things, they really need the federal government to come in and regulate things. And so that would necessitate make uh, federal oversight necessary. And in time, they are going to pass um, a law called the Interstate Commerce Act that theoretically makes this possible for the federal government to regulate railroads between states. It's going to be passed during this time period, but not enforced. So it's kind of a missed opportunity to help the farmers, uh, the federal government help the farmers. So they form a political party called Populism, or the People's Party. The members are the, the less powerful groups in society, the farmers, the factory workers, the common little people of society. And they want two metals to back money so that more money can be printed. They want to limit uh, work hours and they want to regulate the railroads. And they nominate this man pictured in this cartoon to be their presidential nominee. His name is William Jennings Bryan. And he very passionately campaigns across the whole country, ironically, or um, using the railroads, which he's actually um, trying to regulate. Um, but he's a passionate and ardent campaigner and he goes all around the country. And one of his famous speeches is called his Cross of Gold speech, where he talks about how the common people are being sacrificed on a cross of gold and that this needs to stop, that they are basically bearing the burden of society and that the wealthy are placing upon them this crown of thorns and cross of gold and that they need to be brought down off the cross of gold and quit being made kind of the sacrificial lambs of society. And it would really whip people up into a frenzy and um, was a very powerful um, campaign slogan that uh, the poorer people really identified with who felt like that they were being trampled upon by the wealthy. The Republicans are kind of the establishment candidate uh, party and they really don't want any social change or regulation and many of them are wealthy, powerful business interests. Um, and they nominate, um, you can see there on your handout, they nominate um, William McKinley and he's called the front porch campaigner. He's from Ohio and he's famous for just coming out on his front porch. Uh, they would actually, the uh, political bosses within the cities, we'll be talking more about political machines, but the political bosses in the cities and the wealthy would f uh, bring people out on trains to McKinley's house. He didn't actually have to go anywhere, unlike William Jennings Bryan, who's going all across the country. They would bring them to his house to gather outside in front of his house, and he would come out on his front porch, and he would go to one side of the porch and wave, and he would go out on the other side of the porch and wave, and then he would go back in. That was his whole campaign. Um, they really didn't want McKinley to say much. They thought he looked presidential and that he seemed presidential, but they really didn't want him to make any promises or talk too much. It was a very kind of, um, a campaign that was very he heavy on symbolism, I guess, and um, vague generalities. So, uh, promising prosperity and prestige and those kinds of things. So, who do you think won? Big money won. And uh, as a result, the populists are very, very upset because their best chance to try and bring significant regulation to the economy and significant social change to help the, the little guy uh, basically was lost. 
But if they were smart, they would have hope. See, the populists are all sad. We didn't, our guy didn't win, and big money won. And But um, within the Republican Party, there's this wacky reformer. And the Republicans aren't quite sure what to do with him. His name is Teddy Roosevelt. He had uh, been active in uh, New York, and he's he's going to have led um, troops in the Spanish-American War, which we're going to talk about. He's really heroic, really charismatic, really loved by the people. And the Republicans are scared to death of him because they're in his party. Uh, he's in their party, but they're not big on social change, and he's all about social change and the little man. So they decide to hide him away in what they think is the dumbest job in America. And that job is... um. The vice presidency, right? How often does the president die? Never. So what they decide is let's hide Teddy Roosevelt away as McKinley's vice president and then we won't have to worry about him actually changing anything or um, protecting little people. Well guess what? McKinley gets shot. Yes he sure does. In 1900 and guess who's going to launch onto the national stage as a true reformer? Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, this is going to be shocking to the Republican Party because they're not quite sure what to make of this guy. But um, he's going to dust off populism and reform it and remarket it. And he's going to call it something a little different. It's going to be called progressivism. But it's going to address a lot of the concerns of the poor people. We're not going to get more money printed, but we are going to get regulation of the railroads and a lot more done to help protect workers in the factories and uh, the little man, basically. So um, there is hope out there. The populists just don't know that it's coming, uh, even though McKinley has been elected. So, um, if we look then at the outcome of this, we want to see how it relates to the Wizard of Oz. So, let's think about this. Oz is an abbreviation for the word ounces. And what is measured in ounces? Well, gold is. So, the Wizard of Oz is really about the Wizard of Gold. Dorothy is considered to be kind of like the everyman, the common man with a good heart and a good spirit and soul. But um, she just doesn't quite know exactly how best to go about um, getting home and, and addressing the problems that she sees. The Wicked Witch of the West represents the railroads, um, whereas the Wicked Witch of the East, which is still alive, represents the banks. And so it's Dorothy has to, has to face off against both the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wicked Witch of the East uh, to try and get victory for the common, the common man is the idea. So, um, the munchkins are the little people, the common people who don't have much power. They're small in stature because that represents the amount of power they have in society. The yellow brick road is um, the gold, you know, gold blocks, the gold standard. The idea is that if you take her shoes, okay, in the movie her shoes are red. But in the book by Frank Baum, all of this is based on books written by Frank Baum, of which there are many, more than just one. Her shoes were silver. So the idea is if you take the silver shoes and you put them on the yellow brick road, which is gold, you're going to have bimetallism. The Tin Man represents the factory workers who are being treated like they're machines, like they don't have a heart. And the Scarecrow represents the farmers who um, uh, think that they're being treated like they don't have a brain and that they don't know they're being ripped off by the banks. And, um, but of course they, they are, and they're smart enough to know this. So, um, and the lion is considered to be William Jennings Bryan, and he has uh, got a lot of bluster, a lot of charisma. He goes around making a lot of noise, but he actually doesn't have a lot of power. Um, the Emerald City is Washington, D.C., and it's green because that's where they make money. The money supply is the source there. And you would think that the president would have a lot of power in Washington about this, but what they find out is that the president is not the seat of power in Washington during this time period. In fact, it's the people with the money, the banks, the Wicked Witch of the East, and the Wicked Witch of the West, which is the railroads. So um, this is thought to be, we're not certain, this is all a bit of speculation, but the timing of Frank Baum writing these books and the rise of populism and all of these um, uh, connections seems to be a little bit um, too good to be true in terms of its correspondence. So, bet you didn't know that the Wizard of Oz is actually a allegory for populism, my pretties. Whoa. So, now you know. <laughs>